This morning we plan to kick things off as we talk about restorative justice. We talk about our new uh, Commissioner of Police uh, designate and we also plan to talk a little bit about the way forward. Joining us on set is Director of Blue Line Security. Uh, he's also a security consultant and uh, he is Paul Daniel Nahus. He's no stranger to us. Good morning and morning. welcome. It's a pleasure to have you. My pleasure. So we understand that you are currently partnering with the prisons to support their rehab program yep. through Blue Line. So my yeah. first question, what exactly is Blue Line? Oh, um, for, just to correct you, we're not a security company. Okay. It's um, actually a training agency. It's an academy. We provide security training. We provide civilian training for mostly now we're um, doing a lot of air rifle target shooting. Um, affiliated with many international bodies for sport shooting, and that is open to civilians. We also do consulting for um, counterterrorism, for security companies, for uh, uh, um, a lot of different areas of security. Especially one thing we focus a lot on now is use of force training for security companies. Okay, what sort of experience do you, you come with? Um, I'm not going to read my entire CV here, but um, I do have a bachelor's in criminal justice. I am a master chaplain in Homeland Security. I'm currently pursuing my doctorate in security management. I have a lot of functional training in terms of um, critical incident management, tactical training in rifle, pistols, shotguns for special operations, law enforcement. I trained for a while as a sniper and specialized as a police or urban sniper um, in the US. And I have a list of training, um, some with Homeland Security as well. And I, I wouldn't go too much on it, but um, in my experience, um, I was a security manager um, and I managed over 1,200 people on a daily basis at a point. I was a training manager. I had r written up entire training programs for companies. And the one thing I always made sure when I was working as a training manager was that um, use of force was something close to my heart. And I used to actually lecture that myself. And I tried to develop those programs as much as possible. So let's talk a little bit about the collaboration you have currently with prisons. Yeah. What is, in what capacity have you all been working together? Well, right now, I um, just want to mention that they have a new program. Um, they use hashtag 180 about to it, where the presence has a new view on rehabilitation. It's been like that for a little while now, but I really have to thank the Commissioner of Prisons, as well as um, the Assistant Commissioner, Sharon Bruce, who is the head of programs. <coughs> If anyone was to, you know, we like to talk as Trinidadians or prisoners do nothing, we see the corruption in the papers, the prison officers and so. If you go down to the prisons and see the programs they're running in rehabilitation, it is amazing stuff. It is it's getting close and close to first world status. In terms of our collaboration, we kind of chose a, a pet project there that we want to help fund and we want to help set up. Um, the one that we have actually chosen was the Rabbit Breeding Program, whereby on August 19th, well, since we are... Um, a training academy we also have a gun club and our air rifle target team has actually picked up this cause of doing on august 19th a charity shoot it's 400 dollars for the day to come and shoot you have to go through a background check i'll give me please remind me to give me sure. information so that people could contact me for it but you can check blue line on facebook um my number is 718-4069 718-4069 or you can email dtc trinidad at gmail.com as in delta tango charlie trinidad dtc trinidad gmail.com for more information but what we're using that to do now is um, someone had donated rabbit wire and the things they're using to set up the rabbit pens but in their cooling system we had priced an industrial fan it seemed to be too expensive so there was another cooling system we were looking into we're going to do a side visit actually hopefully next week um, to see how much it'll cost total but we're raising those funds to go into that now we chose rabbit breeding and people might say well why rabbit breeding and I would just say it's because a it's a program they really want to get off the ground. And if anyone asks why not this sector of agriculture, why not this? Because they have a lot going on. They actually have a lot of agriculture. They're growing a lot of stuff. They're making their own pepper sauce. They're making green seasoning. Um, um, they're making all these different things up there. If you see the crops that they grow there, they're raising um, pigs, cows. They have all the prisons almost 100% capacity in terms of their own milk supply self-sustained. Um, they are also doing, or the one thing they are really hoping to get off the ground, but they haven't started as yet in a big capacity because it's expensive, is a layers program for, to, to make eggs, mm -hmm. breed chickens, make eggs, and so on. <laughs> and people will be surprised to know, too, that there's, um, they got equipment donated, um, and they still need more, but they, they uh, st have started a recycling program whereby they are trying to get the prisons 100% recycling there to the extent where not only are they recycling prison waste, 
where they ask officers to collect their recyclables at home and for prison officers to bring recyclables there to recycle. Wow. How long have you all been partnering? Um, let's see. Only maybe earlier this year, um, okay. I went to YTC to do a visit with um, a, a church ministry that was doing that. So I said, all right, I went in with them. I kept trying to keep an open mind, talk to some of the boys. Um, I met up with the assistant commissioner outside as well as um, a couple of the seniors in, in prisons and uh, some juniors as well. And they were very, I found they were very passionate about it. So we exchanged cards and I just asked, well, with Mr. Bruce, how can I, how can I help? One thing led to another. He invited me to the agri-fair because they have an agriculture fair. I got to take home a lot of nice produce that they made. Um, well, they grew, I should say. Also, too, I noticed um, on the commissioner's grounds, I asked the ACP, you know, who, who does the landscape in? He, he smiled and said, the prisoners. Mm -hmm. um, and the guys there that were, uh, well, we refer to them as clients now, and they treat the terminology and everything. They were very polite, and, you know, it, it seemed like these men did not seem like they were incarcerated. And it's because, well, they've moved, moved hard labor, too. They, they consider hard labor. Um, they put you in an agriculture program. They put you in a landscaping program. They're using hard labor for reform, not just this whole thing of breaking big rocks into small rocks. Yeah. as the stereotypical yes. thing. But, so they've been doing great work, so I just asked how I can partner with them, how, I can, how can I help out. And one thing led to another, uh, another. I found that one program, they maybe had about three rabbits or so, and they wanted to start this rabbit breeding. Also, when they, the way they build the cages, they're collecting the waste to recycle as well and use. So I was like, oh, well, okay, just choosing this. Let me try to get this off the ground. I spoke to my team, um, you know, explained to them how important I think it is because as some of the seniors in police were saying, um, when, I'm sorry, prisons, my bad, they were saying that this is a public safety issue. It's not just we hold them in the prison and then let them out. We have to try and reform them yes. and make them a low risk out when they come outside so they won't end up back in here and a danger to the public. So that's the line prisons is going along. And I have to really thank, um, besides from the commissioner and the assistant commissioner, people like, for example, Mr. Guy and so on, um, the, the prison officer one for communications, even the, the lower rank uh, prison officer, sorry, uh, they have really taken up these causes and they are really pushing. And I want to credit the commissioner of prisons as well in that a very humble fellow um, in the launch of their 180 program and so on, he didn't take the credit for himself. He kept on crediting those under him and... I think these seniors in prisons are really showing true leadership in terms of developing not just the the um, rehabilitation programs and helping people, but in developing and letting the younger officers really spread their wings and do what they can to help the prisoners. What is your long-term vision for this initiative? My long-term vision is to have, is to see, sir, I should say. It's my long-term vision is to see a prison factory, to see conveyor belts with them bottling and selling. They're planning to sell their stuff outside, they produce and stuff. Um, they're working right now to be able to produce everything on a consistent basis year round and sell it to sell outside. And my vision is to go into Massey stores and see a whole shelf just of prison products, to see a whole section of, of um, the produce, prison produce, to see the prison symbol over. That is my vision in terms of how I would like to see this. This is it's also my vision to see members of the public partnering to underst and understanding that Rehabilitation is not just a prison's problem, it's a public safety issue, and it is everyone's responsibility. Just like law enforcement, to an extent, we have to be responsible to report to police. If you see something, say something. We have to be involved as civil society in prison reform. Now, unfortunately, the positives don't really get highlighted. All these things that you just mentioned, the 180 program, I don't think many people would have heard about it before. But, but you'll, hear, you'll hear about... Um, when contraband is, is not present, Well, right? this is what I was going to ask that, right? you. Uh, we've recently seen some uh, <coughs> video footage and pictures circulating on social media uh, regarding prisoners, <coughs> contraband items. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I can't comment too much on mm. that because I've never explored that area of the criminal justice in Trinidad. Um, the commissioner said he's going to deal with it, and um, so I'm a man of his word. However, I think it's a very complicated issue because... Remember, um, the seniors, they have, okay, they have their program section, they have different sections, and the commissioner is overseeing a lot, but he cannot physically be on the ground all the time. He can't physically be in the cells. He can do an inspection. He can do certain things at certain times. Um, however, that's deal with uh, institutionalized corruption in the system, which I, I believe they're trying their best to weed out right now. But as I said, one, one video of something, one instance of something is going to get out there, and it's going to ruin the whole thing, and I really... I'm pleading with the public not to let that operation section 
damage the image of the rehab programs and not let it tarnish the good work that has been done in prisons right now. Right. So I'd like to talk, talk a little bit about the appointments of Gary Griffith as Commissioner of Police. Mm -hmm. You come with a wealth of experience in crime fighting and security and that sort of thing. What are your thoughts on Mr. Gary Griffith? My thoughts is that um, it's a, he's a very good pick for the position. It would be a gross understatement to say he's qualified for the position. Um, I want to thank, and in the same light that he did, the outgoing commissioner, acting commissioner of police. Um, it was a, a six-year run. I really think that it should have been an appointment or not after a certain amount of time. Um, I think it was a little unfair to him, but I want to thank Mr. Williams for, for the service he did give to the country as he's going to retirement soon. Um, they had a lot of good officers who applied. Some unfortunately didn't get, didn't, not only one person could come out in the end. They still have two to appoint deputies as well. I think he's a good pick. Uh, I think it was a long total decision. And I will go with best practice. In the scoring, he scored the highest under the KPMG scoring systems. And they used, they didn't just sit down and make up their systems. They brought international experts. Um, they put them through rigorous, rigorous testing for a period of time. And he came out on top. I think he has the right attitude because in where whereas now criminals are waging war against society and we feel on a daily basis the social fallout, which is something we can't handle. He understands this and in wartime you need a wartime commander, right? What about his strategy and his approach to crime fighting? What are your thoughts on his strategy based on also his performance as Minister of National Security? I can comment a lot on his performance as Minister of National Security because I saw some of it at the brief glimpses I had at the NOC. And uh, Mr. Griffith put in not only a lot of work, but intelligent work. Uh, he, he believes in intelligence-based policing, intelligence-based law enforcement, intelligence-based security. And what he established with the NOC, what he was establishing in national security, he was pushing us as far as possible towards a first world. Actually, as a matter of fact, what he set up was a first world system. And everything else was lagging behind. And he was doing what he could to bring the other agencies in, um, into it and to make use of the first world systems he was setting up, as well as the facilities. Uh, unfortunately, as a minister of national security, you can do so much. You can set policy, you can direct certain things, but you can't give orders to the police. You can set policy and so on. The commissioner of police is in charge of the operations. Um, Chief of Defense Staff is in charge of military operations. There, there, there are certain lines you can't cross. Um, I think he did very well to try and bridge certain gaps, but at the end of the day, he was limited. Also, too, he was limited by his government at the time, where there was only so much he could do. When the prime minister pulled the plug on certain things, he couldn't do anything about it. But what he did do was a lot, and I think if he brings that mentality in police, um, he'll do very well because he believes not only in harsh operations and f quick operations, uh, he also believes in having it being based on some type of intelligence and he's very focused on training, retraining, mm -hmm. and keeping a certain standard. If he keeps his standard that he was trying to keep in national security in the police service, we are going to have um, some growing pains. There are going to be some teething problems, but overall he has the potential right now to push the police service into an entirely different era of law enforcement trying to be. Now, he was passionate about the National Operations Center, but mm -hmm. it's no longer in operation. No, so no. So, what do you think his plan would be moving forward? I think he's going to take some of the same concepts in training and in theatering from that and apply it to the police. And they are capable in the police service of applying that. They are capable of using that. Also, too, I think his relationship with the Chief of Defense staff in that they were in the military together. And so, I think that's going to be a benefit in terms of any type of cross-training that is needed or any type of support, heavy support in operations, for example. Um, the military does have a responsibility, not in law enforcement, but in assisting civil services and assisting law enforcement when necessary. And if that assistance is needed, I think that they, you know, for lack of a better term relationship, um, in that just that they under, could understand each other, will help as well. And as I said, I don't think there's anything that he can't transition into police. And there were things he wanted to do with the police service when he was in national security um, to better to better polish off the service and to better train the service. I think he's going to be able to now implement because as a commissioner of police, he can direct operations. He can implement all the policies himself. Uh, I think it's going to be a new era for the police. And it's going to be, as I said, they're going to have growing pains. People that, uh, there'll always be that with a switch of commissioner. But I think he's really he really wants to revolutionize it. Uh, and his approach is he's going to hit the ground running. 
And if once he keeps up that momentum, uh, I think it will be to the benefit of his citizens. With your expertise and his style in terms of incorporating intelligence-based uh, crime-fighting initiatives, mm -hmm. do you see yourself possibly working with him? I'm open to that possibility. And if I'm called upon, I have said before, if I'm called upon to serve my country in any capacity, I, I would serve. Um, I would assist in Mr. Griffith is not a stranger to me. Right? He can contact me if he wishes. Um, and I would look any, anywhere that I could help, I would help. Because um, I, I would like to be more involved in law enforcement in terms of those operations, in terms of training, in terms of wherever I may be of use. Um, because right now, I think that not just for myself, but the other experts in certain areas of law enforcement, certain areas, um, not just of law enforcement, I'm talking about even in counseling for, for officers who may have shot someone and, and so on. You know, there are people, there are civilians right now, and even non-civilians working as civilians, they need to be brought in and they need to, we need to, what we need to do is we need to start competing as well with the private sector. It's very difficult, but you have to make it appealing um, as much as possible, obviously, within um, parameters and parameters for, to get the best from the private sector. Because we can't keep just pulling those who, all right, you're applying to be a police officer, you're going to be a police officer. So we have to use the SRP program as well to do what initially it was attended for, not just to boost numbers, but also to bring in certain specialized people to assist in certain areas and certain units that may have a more direct impact on, on situations. For example, the gang situation, the terror situation, um, these, these things in Trinidad where they need that expertise. Uh, for example, not to criticize, but... Well, I'm going to criticize anyway, but the operations that happened over Carnival with the um, counterterrorism and so on and the, the whole threat that they were looking at. Um, I don't believe, I believe there was basis for it, but I think the operations handled sloppily. Um, you know, some people were affected by it in, uh, in a violent way as well. The state may be facing, I believe they are facing some lawsuits right now for it. And I think it was handled that way because they did not have the right people um, on top of it. I think that the people who understood the situation, if you hear, I heard from one of the people who were actually someone that I believe is innocent in it, who was actually roughed up and who was actually, his door was broken down, his nose was damaged and all this kind of thing. And I said, but he has no record. He has no, there's no intelligence on him at all. There's intelligence on a family member of his. But that doesn't mean that if there's no intelligence on someone, anyway, you can't just kick down someone's door and brutalize them. Also to the exchange from that end of it where that the, they, you know, the way they handle it, they were knocking on the door and banging on it, and there was a whole there were minutes of exchange and words and so on. And I mean, that is so sloppy in terms of a sensitive area of law enforcement uh, and of if to, to expand on it, homeland security. So I believe that specialized people need to be brought in. And also, too, um, no fault of a lot of the officers. What happens is that if I send, let's just say I dispatch an officer to such a situation and he's not trained fit, he's not prepared fit, then I can't fault him for not handling it. He handles it in a way that he thinks, I would like to think he thinks is best. So um, I also had commented before that officers that do not have adequate training and that get injured in line of duty due to inadequate training should sue the government fit. Because you sent, you sent someone to a situation knowing that they're not equipped fit, knowing that they're not prepared fit. And this is what um, I like with uh, Mr. Griffith is that he has a strong focus on this training and this our experience supervision aspect of law enforcement and of security and that's something we desperately need in security in Toronto because we need proper management of it from training to operations and I think he'll bring that attitude into it especially being someone experienced in private sector management. I also wanted to get your thoughts on the national crime prevention program that was recently mm -hmm. launched. What are your thoughts on their approach in terms of that collaborative effort no. involving other ministries? Like well, Ministry I, 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 I can comment a lot on that because I am actually involved in it in terms oh. of being all of them for Diego Martin. Right, yes. I'm chairing the Disaster mm -hmm. Security Committee. So the ch um, Chairman Hong, the Chairman Diego Martin Regional, obviously won, as soon as it launched, she brought me in right with her. Um, and when I say brought in, I'd like to point out that we are not given any instruments. We have not been given any instruments appointment. We are not paid for this. This is something that members of the corporation and local government that are spearheading and involved, we, we are not compensated for this. This is something we do just out of our sense of duty for the region and being brought in on that now. What I want the public to understand is that I think maybe the wrong impression was, was um, gotten out of the launch of it. Or I don't have given or gotten out of the launch, but it's not a police initiative. It's not um, 
a law enforcement initiative. It is not an intelligence gathering initiative. This is a community initiative. It, it's an interministerial approach spearheaded by local government. And what we're doing is that we are seeking to fulfill needs of community by, and I know we like to throw on through empowerment all the time, but what we are trying to do is figure, all right, this region has, what are the talents the people in communities have and how can we take that and bring them into programs and so on, not just send them to YTEP, but actually try and get them to develop programs within the communities to help. For example, we were thinking um, initially about sport. <laughs> well, you know, everyone has kickball and batball for every social program, every other social program in Trinidad. So we went along a different line where we're trying to develop Indigo Martin under the, the National Crime Prevention Program, um, tourism with Indigo Martin, when we the, actually the municipal police inspector, acting inspector Rivers, she was commenting on one meeting that, you know, Digo Martin has a water wheel and we have this and that. She's wait, but what about tourism? Not just from away, but internally, if we get tour buses, um, and this is what we need to partner with ministries for now because we need those resources to get buses to run and so and set up um, little market villages in each of the communities. For example, Lance Meter, known for the roast fish, and Parmen, known for different products. And so, you know, when bus stop off, stops off, it can be a day out of it, people taking tours and coming out, seeing what the, the locals in the communities can produce and so. But my vision for that too is that we're not just going to set up a, a drag mall. We want to teach people, all right, you want to vend these things? All right, this is the process. It's a very easy process. This is what we can make easy through the corporation. You come to us, you want to set up these things, or should I say we come to you because we have been, even before we launched this program, this program launch was just, it was just um, formal, this formal, formal thing. We yeah. have been on the ground for months upon months. And this is not us telling the community what they, they need or want. We have been meeting in a barber shop in Lansmeter, um, down in Carnage, people from Smith Hill, well, Smith Hill, um, Big Yard, and Lansmeter. We, cho we didn't cho choose the whole region, and we're going to do the whole region, no. We chose three small communities, and we're going to expand afterwards. We brought people from the communities in the barber shop. All right, we sat down. Let's have a discussion. And we've been doing this for months. We've been doing workshops at the Ministry of National Security for months, discussing and planning out all this. So, what we're doing is we're getting their feedback. We decided to do this. And what I said was that um, the drag mall idea, let's not do that. Let's have people come to us. We can ease it up for them. Teach them how to apply for permissions. Teach them how to set up their business. Teach them as well about the overhead costs, about different things in business. Um, and me having a business, could, you know, I could better partner with people to, to come in and talk, speak to them about that. Um, how do you set up a business? How do you register the company? How do you do these things? So that you're no longer just, you know, um, Verna setting up a, a Verna's fish stall. You can have a business and you can take that. And when it becomes big enough, you know what? You want to rent somewhere in Port of Spain. By the time you go to set up that, you already know how to run a business. You already know that there's um, legal aspects of it. You, you already know that. So it's more than just setting up this for them. It's teaching them how to be um, true entrepreneurs or how to be true business people. So we're hoping to get that those collaborations and communities. And to comment on the prisons as well, to go back to that for a second, I've been trying to get in contact with some people to um, to partner with me as well in, it, in going into the prisons and teaching these prisoners um, business programs or how to run a business and so on. Not just from theory or from school, but people who have been in business for a number of years, people who are no business in terms of, they don't have to have a formal education in business, mm -hmm. but if they know how to make a dollar in a professional way, to bring them in. Because the point of these programs in prisons is to actually teach them how to survive outside in the event that they can't get a job as well. Because the prison officers are very aware that people, even though they, they are some of them assess, most of them assess as low risk when they come out in the programs, they are aware that people have this stigma and so. So they're giving them skills that they can get a job or they may be able to do something on their own. A problem is that, yes, even if they can grow the crops and they can grow these things, do they know how to run a business? Do they know how to actually sell? Do they know how to not run into problems with overheads and so on? So I'm hoping to be able to go in and help them a little bit with that as well. And part of my vision as well, if a prison factory is set up and so, to have people trained and qualified to run machinery, to repair machinery and so on it and you know, and they have some, they take them in prisons to do small courses like that. But I want people just in the same way I want people in communities to be empowered in this way. I want the prisoners to, to be empowered as well. Wonderful. Just remind us the uh, blue line and how can we contact you? What services do you offer? Well, right now, um the main things we offer are the civilian marksmanship programs where you still not lose in the US and so where um you can come in without the FUL, without the FUC, without the firearms license, you can use the air rifle target guns we have. Um background checks apply to anyone coming, criminal, 
not only criminal record, but criminal affiliation. Um, we do a background check on you. It takes 24 to 48 hours, depending on how helpful the police are with it. And we provide a lot of training. Every month, we actually do a marksmanship, full marksmanship course. We have the shooting classes. We have competitions. Every three to four months is a competition as well. Very vibrant in that. So people that want that kind of training for sport shooting and target shooting, contact us. Security companies that want training for officers, especially in use of force training, full training programs, uh, management consulting, and compliance consulting, compliance audits, these kind of things. They can contact us at 718-4069 or dtctrinidad at gmail.com, Delta Tango Charlie Trinidad at gmail.com. Um, look for us on Facebook, Blue Line. Shoot us a message, and um, the, the, if you want to be involved in a charity shoot as well that we're going to assist with the prisons with, mm -hmm. you can contact us at the same number, 7184069. Um, that's on August Sunday, August 19th, we're having that. It's $400. Everything is provided for the day. You come with yourself. The only thing we're asking people is to please register early because we have to do the background checks before you're allowed on the compound. So just shoot me an email a phone call message you please blue line on facebook um we're on instagram as well now i forget to mention because i really don't use instagram but um we have an instagram profile which is blue line tt you can find us on instagram as well message us and we'll take care of all the registration we make registration very easy we take care of all the background checks free of charge contact us get involved for august the 19th mm -hmm. so that we can have <coughs> something to take the prisons and we can start setting up these systems to better rehabilitate the prisoners and make Trinidad a safer society on the outside. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure chatting My pleasure, with you. Yeah. We've been talking to Paul Daniel Nahus, director at Blue Line, and he said you can reach him at 718-4069. He's on Facebook and Instagram, and that event takes place on Sunday, August 19th. Right. So here's your local weather forecast with Ian Wallace.